Welcome back to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik, where we bring you news, politics, and culture without the red and blue treatment. I'm John Kiriakou, here with Michelle Witte. The FBI yesterday afternoon arrested 21-year-old Massachusetts Air National Guard member Jack Tashira as the source of the leaks of at least 100 different classified documents that were found on the website Discord and on a page for fans of the Minecraft online game. Tashira will be arraigned today and will likely initially be charged with espionage. Actually, I think he was already arraigned. He's charged with two counts of espionage. He was wearing leg shackles, but his hands were uncuffed, which was very interesting to me. Mm. What is a surprise has been the reaction over the last 24 hours from the political right, many of whom are hailing Tashira as a whistleblower and a hero. Acquaintances of Tashira say he's a racist and a gun nut. But Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeted yesterday that Tashira has revealed information documenting what she calls President Biden's illegal war against Russia. And Fox News broadcaster Tucker Carlson echoed those sentiments, saying that Tashira has blown the whistle on what amounts to executive branch overreach into Congress's ability to declare war. This is all interesting to me from a political perspective, but as we all well know, there is no affirmative defense in an Espionage Act case. Tashira simply will not be permitted to stand up in court and explain why he did what he did. Besides, this is going to be a process that will stretch out at least over the next 8 to 12 months, and there's a lot that we don't know yet. The National Rifle Association is holding its annual convention starting today. Speakers include former President Donald Trump, former Vice President Mike Pence, Governors Chris Sununu of New Hampshire and Christy Nome of South Dakota, former Governor Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas, and entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, and former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley are all appearing remotely. Another participant is Republican Representative Susan Brooks, who is urging Republicans to work with Democrats in Congress to effect meaningful gun legislation. She told the New York Times yesterday that she's been utterly ignored. There's a big surprise. Mm -hmm. We're learning more details about the Montana Republican Party's efforts to change the electoral law in the state solely for the 2024 Senate race in order for whomever the Republican nominee ends up being to defeat incumbent Democratic Senator John Tester. The state Senate yesterday barely approved a measure that would replace only the Senate election and only for next year with a top two voting model. This would keep the state's popular Libertarian Party off the ballot, presumably making it easier for the Republican to win. Mm -hmm. The measure is expected to pass the state house next week and will likely be signed by the Republican governor, but it is also just as likely to be decided in the courts. And California politics are up in the air today. Democrats want Senator Dianne Feinstein to resign, like yesterday. The 89-year-old has missed nearly 60 votes since February when she developed shingles. Her absence has paralyzed the Biden administration's ability to confirm its judicial appointments. Meanwhile, Governor Gavin Newsom has been traveling to Republican states to chide their governors on the abortion issue. And Santa Monica's own Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will formally, officially announce his candidacy for the Democratic nomination for president in Boston on Wednesday. Steve Grumbine is the founder and CEO of the nonprofits Real Progressives and Real Progress in Action and host of the podcast Macro and Cheese. He's also a leading activist and evangelist for modern monetary theory. Steve, welcome back. Always great to have you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Let's start with the big news of the day. That's the arrest of 21-year-old Jack Tashira. Uh, There are so many unanswered questions here, Steve. First, I have to say that I'm surprised at the reaction so far from the political right, hailing Tashira as a whistleblower. Keeping in mind the legal definition of whistleblowing is bringing to light evidence of waste, fraud, abuse, illegality, or threats to the public health or public safety. Is there anything to calling him a whistleblower? First of all, absolutely. Um, I work with, um, in fact, (laughs) my interview for Macro and Cheese, our podcast tomorrow, is with one of the most incredible whistleblowers of all time, 
William K. Black, a, a, a.k.a. Bill Black, who brought down the Keating Five. Hmm. Yeah. Um, he he uh, works with a group of serial whistleblowers and guys like Richard Bowen and others. They're Republicans. Mm-hmm. They're not mm-hmm. <laughs> they are not uh, Democrats. You know, they're not, quote unquote, the good guys. <laughs> uh, but these guys are the good guys. And they are the ones that there are people out there that are committed to blowing whistles. And uh, I don't think either party is particularly hip to it normally. I Mm -hmm. know the Democrats went out of their way to squash whistleblowers. And I know in the past, the whole stars and bars and flags and pork pie hats has prevented the Republicans from really standing with whistleblowers either. Mm -hmm. Now, the flip side here, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that we're heading into a presidential election that the GOP has egg on its face from January 6th. They're still trying to figure out who they are. Are they Republican Trumps? Are they Republican DeSantis? Are they cloth coat Republicans? Are they going to bring Dick Nixon back from the dead? Mm -hmm. I mean, what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. So I think, honestly, that this has got a taint of political uh, stink to it. But that said, I don't hold a person's political affiliation against them for whistleblowing. If the stuff is factual and it, it it should be brought forward regardless. And uh, so that's my stance. Yeah. You know, and and I have to, I have to agree with you in that I am very happy to make strategic alliances, Mm -hmm. right? I've been on the Tucker Carlson show 12 times. Tucker Carlson and I disagree on 98% of all issues, but on the issue of whistleblowing, he is dead right. He's always right on whistleblowing. Uh, somebody sent me a tweet yesterday from Marjorie Taylor Greene. The tweet was dated like April 7th, I think, or April 5th, something like that, in which Marjorie Taylor Greene, whom I loathe, was calling for the immediate release of Julian Assange and for all charges against Julian Assange to be dropped. So it's, it's highly unusual for elected officials to come out in support of a person accused of a national security crime, even before he's arraigned. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene said yesterday, before Jack Deshira was arraigned, that he was a, a whistleblower and a hero and should not be charged. So help us understand the politics behind this. On, on Marjorie Taylor Greene's part, her position is that the war in Ukraine is illegal because there has been no congressional de- uh, declaration of war and that Jack Tashira has revealed um, ostensibly classified information that exposes the crime of undeclared war. So my question then to you is, is that what this is all about for the Republicans? Is this about Ukraine? You know, I'm not willing to give them uh uh, legitimacy uh-huh. in terms of them as people or them as whatever their uh, motivations are. I'm not, I'm not willing to give them legitimacy because I see opportunism all over it. Yeah. That said, yeah. Yeah. I think that the, the truth, it, we, we need to separate the whistleblowing from the motive. And I think that that's really key here. Motive may matter when you're trying to convict someone, but in this case, I don't think motive is as necessary to, to care about. I think it's either true or it's not true. I think the facts are either facts or they're not facts. And I think we need to assess these facts based on it. As far as uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and the rest of the nutters over there, you know, they, they have an old saying, a broke clock is right twice a day. Mm. And I, I, I see a little bit of broke clock here. And I also see a little bit of political opportunism, neither of which invalidates the, the information. Yeah. Uh, Tashira was charged this morning with two felony counts of illegally retaining national defense information without authorization. That falls under the Espionage Act. He could be in for literally dozens more felony counts, which is something that federal prosecutors frequently do. It's called charge stacking. So what they do is they'll, they'll charge you with 10 or 20 felonies, and then they'll offer to drop all of them but one or two if you agree to take a guilty plea. That's why almost none of these cases ever go to actual trial. The whistleblower community, and I'm pretty well tied in to the whistleblower community, hasn't said anything at all about Tashira or about his case, not a single word. Do you expect that to change? Or is this case different from 
Julian Assange, Ed Snowden, Chelsea Manning, and the others? I don't know if I'd say it's different, but I would say that the name Teixeira is relatively fresh and new on the lips. I think that the idea of the impact of what he's revealed um, isn't fully known. I think a lot of people are still uh, wrapped up in their yellow and blue profile pictures. And um, I think a lot of people are just sort of trapped in what it would have been a year long propaganda campaign, basically about our involvement in uh, the politics of Ukraine. So I, I think that it's going to have a slow burn before people either really get into it and really get on it. I know that uh, the Republicans are trying to make it, uh, you know, big theater here. I know when you get Marjorie Taylor Greene in there, there's going to be people reflexively just randomly hate it. But I honestly, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know why whistleblowers aren't on this. Um, yeah. It, honestly, it could possibly be they, they question whether or not this is legit, whether this is just one more thing to get someone on. I, I, I don't know. I, can, I, I, I'm, I have my own questions now that we're kind of walking through that exercise. Yeah, and, and there's a lot that we don't know. For example, yesterday we saw, we saw reports in the mainstream media saying that Tashira had released videos of himself on his social media using racial epithets. His friends say that he's a gun nut. And it's unclear, first of all, whether any of this is true. And secondly, whether it's being used simply to defame him. We don't know what his motivation was, as you said a moment ago, although whistleblower attorneys will tell you that motivation is irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is whether or not the information was in the public interest. So again, well, then and, in and that that's case, whistleblower. Yeah. And you that's, I mean? that's another uh, question <laughs> yeah. that we don't know the answer to. Also, I have to say also, it, everyone involved in this is so young. Oh you know God, what I mean? It's just crazy. I look at a yeah. picture of this guy and I'm like, my God, he looks younger than my own son. Yeah. And I don't mean my oldest son. I mean like my third, my third son who's yeah. young. Which I say just on the topic of like trying to assess what somebody's actual personality is based on stupid things that you say. Exactly. And do. It's not, impossible. It's not, it's, it's, there's certainly a way to view that that's not excusing it, but also recognizing that. People say dumb stuff when they're kids. And people change. Yeah. We all change. If given the opportunity. Uh, yes. What do you, what do you make you of this? You guys Steve? are talking, you, you're talking to a guy that was a former Sig Heil right wing <laughs> Republican, Christo fascist. Uh, really? And Christo fascist, no less. Yes, uh, absolutely, man. I, was, <laughs> I, I went to church. This is no joke. I'll tell you a quick joke and then we'll get back to it. I, I went to church at McLean Bible Church. And, oh, yeah, um, I know that all my one. kids were dedicated there. And I remember sitting in the church. There was Charles Dobson, if you know, focus on the family. Wow, yes. There. Yes. And uh, sitting directly behind me during service was right before the daughter, father daughter dance at the church was none other than Kenneth Starr. Wow. And I remember sitting there in the pew looking at my wife, and I'm writing on the, um, the, the church. Uh, whatever paper that you know, tells you what's going on for the day, the agenda, whatever. And I'm like in big cap letters. Oh my God, it's Kenneth Starr. And you realize I was a right winger. I mean, this sure. is, that's where I was. That sure. was my he, sweet spot. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. set my book down. He looked at the paper and he smiled. He saw me write it. And I was like, what can I say? Anyway, <laughs> um, I got to meet him and his granddaughter at the church. I, you know, he's dead now and all mm-hmm. the other stuff. And I have different feelings about him today than I did then. But, uh, you know, I, it's yeah. a very, very funny time. But um, as far as the change goes in this guy, young guy, I mean, pe- people really do say stupid stuff when they're kids, shocking things, trying to get mm-hmm. attention, sh- you know, trying to fit in. Uh, we're all yeah. awkward. We're all dealing with zits. You know, we haven't right. grown into our heads yet. I mean, we've got a bunch of things going on there, you know, where. We're still not fully developed and fully mature. Mm-hmm. And and I think that you cut people some slack when they're young. I think you got to give people a chance to to grow into whoever they're going to be. And they've got to be able to make the mistakes to make the right choices as well. Yeah. So I I, right. I, I'm, I'm a much more forgiving person about that. I want to ask you, too, about the NRA convention that's taking place beginning today. 
every Republican who's even considering running for president is participating, and they're all trying to outgun each other. Uh, it seems like these NRA conventions always follow a mass shooting. Uh, and that's not, a, <laughs> that's not a coincidence. It's because we have so many mass shootings. <laughs> So usually the, the participants just pretend it hasn't happened. We saw this after Parkland, after Sandy Hook, after Las Vegas. It happens every single year. So my question to you is, does the NRA matter anymore? Does the NRA's presidential endorsement matter anymore? It's, it's become synonymous with the Republican Party. Does anybody care? You know, it's it's another opportunity to organize around a single issue. Yeah, it it, it, it is a a Good point. And I, you know, I wish we did it for the left, um, for things that really matter. You know, like a federal job guarantee, or you know, some of the other more important things like universal basic services. We don't yeah. have those kind of organizations out there. But you look at the right wing, and they've got tons of them. And, you know, and, and they serve the purpose of educating on a very specific subject, not watered down and not marginalized by, you know, if everything's an issue, nothing's an issue. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, they allow themselves to remain very, very vocal, vocal and focal on their issue. So, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, I mean, I'm not happy about it. I don't like the uh, NRA. I'd like to see it disbanded, but it's highly effective at what it does. And what it does is propagandize the masses about, you know, guns, mm -hmm. keeping guns, mm -hmm. maintaining the, uh, you know, support, the focus on fighting back against any increment, uh, incremental pushes against the second amendment. So you got to give them credit. I don't like it. I, in fact, I find them deadly merchant merchants of murder, but at the same time though, they're highly effective in what they do. Yeah, I think that's right. This congresswoman from Indiana said that she wants to be able to work with Democrats in in Congress about um, meaningful gun legislation. She didn't say what that was. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's even a remote possibility that Democrats and Republicans could work together on some sort of gun legislation? It's happened in the past, but when I say past, we're talking 25 and 30 years ago. If the answer is yes, uh, where might there be common ground? You know, I think anything's possible, but I think the political uh, environment that we have right now doesn't really lend itself to any kind of uh, meaningful legislation, honestly. If, yeah. if, if, if they did anything, they might increase the number of days to wait for a gun. I don't know. Right. I can't imagine right. them producing any kind of meaningful – and let me tell you part of why that is, right? The focus on the AR-15 – it's kind of like the people that are into guns know that it's more about having fun. They're, they're collectors. These are guys that sit there and put their hands in their pockets and lift up the hood of the car and say, let me show you my, you know, whatever. Yeah. And, and these yeah. folks are the same way with their guns. But for the people that are the anti-gun part, they're, they're so hyper-focused on this one particular gun that – it, it, I don't see how the two sides ever get together. They're not speaking the same language. They're not focused on the same things. And so the solutions that typical, you know, gun control advocates have and uh, gun uh, freedom advocates have, uh, the nutters versus the uh, takers, Yeah. I, I, I don't see either of them ever finding a meaningful pathway forward. It's going to take somebody getting killed on a massive scale but even even recently, you saw Republicans coming out saying, oh, well, people die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People die. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I don't think it's possible. I, Steve, I'm outraged by the Montana Republican Party's uh, just bald faced efforts to steal the U.S. Senate election in 2024. A large block of Republican state senators voted against this legislation, but it passed anyway, just barely. This will have to be decided in the courts, is my guess. What do you make of this move to to keep the libertarians off the ballot in uh, in the 2024 Montana race and then to have the lost sunset at the end of the year? So in all future races, the libertarians are back on the ballot. Well, you know what? I mean, we see this happen all the time. I mean, differently, but the same. Yeah. I and mean, this is so specific, though. 
that it's like you almost shockingly like how are they doing this right but i mean you saw this happen in pennsylvania where they kept the greens off the the ballot you and, saw and this in happen. north carolina absolutely yep i mean matthew ho didn't get on i mean there's so yep. many instances where they play these games now i i will tell you as much as i am a third party champion in theory i also don't believe that our system really is built in such a way that even if you get libertarians or greens or anybody else in there that you're going to be able to see the kind of change you think you're going to see this is to my way of thinking the way that the whole system is kind of built to reinforce the status quo is maybe you get some talking points from somebody on television but largely i don't think it changes anything so impact limited in my opinion but it's still an oppression and it's still screwed up and it's still in my opinion criminal um and and some action should be taken because regardless of whether i think it makes a big difference or not i think it's pretty pathetic and it's terrifying, actually. Let's talk also about what's going on in the California Democratic Party for a minute. Dianne Feinstein recently, if temporarily, took herself off the Senate Judiciary Committee. That is a finger in the proverbial dike. Do you see a scenario where Feinstein is able to remain in the Senate? She seems, she seems to be not exactly in her right mind, ex according to colleagues who say that in many cases, she doesn't remember their names. Mm -hmm. She's 89 years old, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. um, she's been sick for a long time. You know, I have friends and relatives who have had shingles. You don't miss two months of work from shingles. Uh, and she's coming up on two months. So do you see a scenario where, whereby Feinstein is able to remain in the Senate. It seems like it would be far better for the Democratic Party in California if she were to resign and if Governor Newsom could appoint a successor. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it, it would be the smartest thing ever. I mean, there's <laughs> there's no sundowner law, though. Right? No. There's no law on uh, dementia. There's and, you know, and I'm incredibly sympathetic to the the ailment. But when you're dealing with laws and you're dealing with the ability to function as a democracy and the representative is incapable of meeting the, the job, I think they need to go, period. And, um, you know, so in that sense, to the degree at which I believe that she's able to do anything, I, I think I, I don't see how they allow her to stay in there. Um, I think. You know, it's not something new, by the way. I mean, oh, no. she's been kind of on the fringe of, of her wits for years. And yes. some of the stuff, I mean, wowza, right? Yeah. So um, I, I think I think it is, she's about 10 years past her uh, freshness date. I think it's time for her to be retired, literally. Why is Gavin Newsom traveling to so many red states? He's using his own campaign funds to do it. Does he expect Joe Biden to not run for re-election and is thus trying to maintain national exposure for himself? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, regardless of Biden's stance, I think that when you are the governor of a state like California, um, you've already basically managed a country. I mean, California's huge. Yeah. And the, the opportunity to stay in the limelight, to build that national presence, so that you're not the new kid on the block when you go out there campaigning, where people are more skeptical of you. I see this as a calculated move. I see this as part of a larger plan. And you know, even though I'm not a Gavin Newsom fan, I, I will oh say my. that it's it's pretty smart when you think about it because he's playing the long game, and this is what most people don't do anymore. They're all into quick wins and uh, very very quick turnaround uh, kind of you know, impulse buying behavior, if you will. Yeah. And this shows some discipline. This shows a bit of vision. So I think that speaks well of, of his understanding of the circumstances he's in if he were to try to run. Yeah, I, th I think you're probably right. I wanted to ask you uh, finally about a poll that was released uh, a couple of days ago that shows within the Democratic, uh, uh, oh, sorry, within the Democratic Party, Joe Biden, 27, Bernie Sanders, 12, 
Um, Kamala Harris, 10, Pete Buttigieg, 7, Newsom, 7, Warren, 6, Whitmer, 4, Booker, 3, Klobuchar, 2. Okay, very interesting. Literally none of those people are running for president except for Joe Biden. So why would you even have a poll like that when there actually are two other people running for president? Mm -hmm. You've got Marianne Williamson, who's been running for weeks, Mm -hmm. and you've got RFK Jr., who's been running since last week, which is before this poll was published. Um, There was a morning consult poll that came out day before yesterday that showed Biden with 70 percent, Kennedy with 10 and Williamson with six. Oh, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. But this is the way you sort of in a in a this is the way you begin to demonstrate that some candidates are serious and some aren't, mm-hmm. regardless of whether they're interesting or you you know what I mean. This mm-hmm. is the beginning of that you know the sort of the the media and pollsters telling you who is and who isn't electable from exactly. the start. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's my complaint about this thing. What do you think, Steve? Yeah, I mean, I'm not I, I, I'm already on the record. Uh, I, I stand on that Florida case where the Democratic Party fought successfully that they have no responsibility whatsoever to run a primary. So when I see stuff like this, I say, yep, the, the corporation's doing its thing. It's uh, yeah, it's circling the wagons. It's ensuring that uh, the people they don't want to have any air will be seen as not possible. Yeah. And uh I think this is all part of the propaganda machine that the party puts out there. As far as RFK and Marianne go, you know, I, again, I mean, I I have a real problem now that I've seen them argue in court. I, like, it's almost impossible for me to talk about primaries and stuff like that without hearkening back to that court hearing. Now that I understand there's no legitimacy to the actual primary, that they have no responsibility whatsoever to run a free and fair primary, um, it it doesn't really matter. They can select whoever they want for the role. Mm -hmm. Um, Do I Mm -hmm. think that they're serious? Do I think Marianne's serious? You know, I think she's playing the Bernie Sanders role this time. Do I think RFK is serious? I think for a certain community out there that's into crypto and uh, has a a complete total anti-vax, not just uh, skeptic, but the anti-vax community, I think RFK is somebody that gets them thinking about the Democratic Party, too, which yeah. Democrats have largely been seen as uh, Fauci supporters one way or the other. So right. this is a way of circling the wagons, getting them all focused once again on the Democratic Party. Then, as all good Democrats do, they seed themselves and they say, vote for the nominee, vote for yeah. Biden. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I think that's what I see. That's probably right. Go can ahead, I, Michelle. Can I ask you guys a question? Mm. This is just, sure. uh, I don't know. I don't think we talked on the show about, uh, I know we, Ben and I spoke in the, uh, in the newsroom uh, about these reports from a couple weeks back that Ron DeSantis is just really personally off-putting and has <laughs> right. uh, g- gross personal habits like eating pudding with his fingers. Uh, and re- DeSantis has responded to these attacks by saying, <laughs> by saying he wouldn't even eat pudding anyway because it's got too much sugar in it, which is really not, a cool defense either. Well, the the Daily Beast has this story about uh, a MAGA attack ad that is ripping DeSantis on these pudding habits. And what is notable to me, I mean, first, it's very funny. There's a still of like a dude with chocolate all over three fingers shoving them into his mouth. Um, and the the ad aired during Fox and Friends this morning. Wow. Some of the text included this. Ron DeSantis loves sticking his fingers where they don't belong. And we're not just talking about pudding. DeSantis has his dirty fingers all over senior entitlements, like cutting Medicare, slashing social, social security, even raising our retirement age. Wow. I do think this is very interesting that like the Republicans are all running to the right of Donald Trump. Oh, yeah. They're going to make him the moderate candidate. Wow. They're going to make him the moderate choice. And I think, like, you know, it's very good trying to tie him to, uh, you know, trying to t- tie DeSantis and these other people to cutting entitlements. This is basically what uh, what Joe Biden is doing, too, because this is politically smart. But, like, what a weird race this is going to wow, be man. when you have a bunch of freak Republicans to the right of Donald Trump and Trump again getting to campaign is like, 
I'm actually a sensible guy and I want seniors to be able to like pay for their food. And, you know, I'm not for, you know, I'm, I'm not like these crazy Republicans. And I'm also not lying to you like the Democrats and saying America's well, already great. It's working so it far. It concerns me. It's working. There, th- We were talking earlier, Garland Nixon and I were talking earlier in the newsroom about these new polls. One a Republican poll in Kentucky shows Trump beating DeSantis by 61 percentage points. Mm-hmm. A poll from Massachusetts shows Trump beating DeSantis by 45 percentage points. Garland thinks the whole thing's over already before it's even gotten started. This ad is actually giving me chills. I'm watching it. It's wow. very upsetting to watch a man eat pudding out of a cup with wow. his fingers. I the nomination, understand. the Republican nomination <laughs> is Donald Trump's if he wants it. There's, there's nothing the Democrats can do about this. Steve, we're going to let you go. Steve Grumbine is the founder and the CEO of the nonprofits Real Progressives and Real Progress in Action and host of the podcast Macro and Cheese. He's also a leading activist and evangelist for modern monetary theory. You're listening to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik. 